The History of the Poetry Society of South Carolina, 1920 to 2021, by James J. Lundy, Jr. In the beginning, when it comes to introducing a stranger to the history of the Poetry Society of South Carolina, one cannot go wrong by name dropping DuBose Hayward. Of the founders, he is the most well known of the group today. If his name does not immediately ring a bell, mentioning the opera Porgy and Bess, his collaboration with George and Ira Gershwin usually hits pay dirt. Porgy and Bess is now considered the quintessential American opera, and the song Summertime, whose lyrics were written by Hayward, has been recorded more than any other song in history. Although Hayward achieved a measure of fame in his lifetime and far more after his death, his early life was a series of tragedies, setbacks, and illnesses, making his rags to riches story one of the most compelling in the history of the American South. The tale begins with his most famous ancestor, Thomas Hayward Jr., a wealthy judge, member of the Continental Congress and signer of the Declaration of Independence. The cachet of being from a good family of famous ancestors has always opened Charleston doors, even when families were reduced to barely scraping by in the aftermath of the Civil War. It was into genteel, privileged poverty that Edwin DeBose Hayward who was always called by his middle name, was born to Edwin Ned Watkins Hayward, a wage laborer with the aristocratic bearing of his prosperous Charleston ancestors, and Jane, Janie Scriven DuBose Hayward, an economic refugee from the Midlands, who was also of a prosperous planter class heritage and a precarious future. Hayward was born 10 months after the wedding, he was a sickly infant, and there was doubt in Janie's mind that he would make it to the toddler stage. On his first birthday, August 31st, 1886, the greatest earthquake to ever hit east of the Mississippi decimated Charleston. Hundreds were made homeless citywide, and 60 were killed. Fortunately, Janie, who was pregnant with their second child, had taken DuBose on a trip down the coast and was safe. Ned was by himself when the quake hit and bolted from the house in time to avoid a falling ceiling that crushed the chair he had been sitting on. The addition of their second child, Jeannie DeBose Hayward, in the spring of 1887, further stretched the finances of the young family as they continued to move from one rental to the next. Ned was working as the assistant miller at Merchants and Farmers Rice Mill, located at the end of Lawrence Street on the Cooper River, where he took odd shifts as required. On May 21st, 1888, he reported to work shortly after midnight to start a new order of rice through the pounders. Two laborers were on shift with him. He stooped to walk under a horizontal rotating shaft that powered the hoppers feeding rice into the milling machine, a casual motion he and others made routinely as they worked. This time, a protruding screw on the shaft caught his clothes under the back of the collar, and his body began whirling with the shaft at the speed of 150 rotations per minute. His feet and legs alternately smashed into the wood framing above the shaft and onto the floor below, repeating dozens of times before one of the other men was able to stop the steam engine that turned the shaft. His mangled body fell to the floor, and he had enough time to say, Send for my wife, O oh God, have mercy, before he expired. Janie was retrieved from their house at the corner of Chisholm and Trad Street and brought to her husband's body. She was 23, a widow with no means of support, and the mother of a one-year-old daughter and two-year-old son. Janie searched for ways to make ends meet in tough economic times. She ran a boarding house on Sullivan's Island and worked as a seamstress. Meanwhile, she was studying the Gola dialect to learn its vocabulary and sayings and was able to speak it convincingly. This first blossomed into peddling self-published tales that she transcribed from local Gola servants. <laughs> 
She started entertaining tourists for money with lively tales of Charleston's history and Gullah culture, speech, and legends. In later years, she gave performances along the entire eastern coast of the United States. DuBose Hayward worked to help support the family from the time he dropped out of school at age 14 until he was 18 years old. He collected burial insurance payments in the city's slums, supervised field workers at his aunt's plantation during the summer, took office clerk jobs, and worked on the docks along the Cooper River as a cotton checker. He was one of the few whites on the bustling scene. It was there that he was exposed to the world of stevedores, sailors, day laborers, peddlers, gamblers, prostitutes, and various miscreants who would later populate his books so realistically. Throughout his childhood, Hayward was regularly attacked by acute illnesses. However, nothing had prepared him for his ordeal with polio at the age of 18. Indeed, Charleston itself was unprepared for the disease, then called infantile paralysis. It was new to the area, and Hayward was one of the early cases. He received treatment in Philadelphia through the quick intervention of his astute relative, Caroline Sinkler. He returned to Charleston in the summer of 1903 and spent the remainder of the year recuperating on Sullivan's Island. Polio left him virtually skeletal in his arms, shoulders, and torso, with his right hand rendered nearly useless and claw-like. Following his recuperation from polio, he came down with typhoid fever and a life-threatening case of pleurisy in quick succession. To recover, he spent two years in the dry desert air of Arizona at a sanatorium. By the time he was ready to come back to Charleston, he faced an uncertain future. He was 23, without much of a formal education, and too frail for physical labor. He clerked at various businesses over the years before founding a general insurance agency with his friend Harry J. O'Neill, the brother of artist Elizabeth O'Neill Verner. Their firm, Hayward and O'Neill, had its office in the People's Building at 18 Broad Street. The firm prospered. Hayward was a successful businessman by the time the Poetry Society began. He would remain an insurance man for many years before he was making enough money from his writing career to give up selling insurance permanently. Hayward's interest in writing grew in the years before the great end of the Great War. He found time to experiment with poetry, stories, plays, and a movie script, but his lack of education revealed itself on every written page. He was acquainted with local writer John Bennett through social circles and began to come to him for assistance and mentoring. Bennett was an author, poet, artist, jack-of-all-trades, family man, prodigious letter writer, historian, armchair philosopher, scholar, taxidermist, musician, and wit. He was also a procrastinator to the nth degree and could be petty, underhanded, overreactive, hypercritical, and chauvinistic. He wrestled with depression. He was a perfectionist to the point of suffering for it. He wrote one of the most loved children's books of the 19th century, several other books that sold well, some that sold poorly, and labored on one novel for decades but never finished it. In short, Bennett is a fascinating character. John Bennett was born in Chillicothe, Ohio, at the tail end of the Civil War, to a family that was neither rich nor poor, although they often flirted with the latter. He showed an early aptitude for art, but was equally proficient at writing. He began a career as a newspaper journalist when he was in his teens. Later, he became a freelance writer and found early success in publishing stories, artwork, and poems in magazines. It was in those years he published his most famous poem, In a Rose Garden, when he was 30 years old. It has since been anthologized, reprinted, and even set to music. Bennett was a workaholic, and to use a portmanteau that had yet to be invented when he was working, overworking himself to the brink of physical and nervous exhaustion in the late 1800s. Through his drive to succeed and his recurring abuse of cocaine, he found himself emaciated and at the brink of death more than once. 
Cocaine was legally available in those years in various forms, including cigarettes, powder, and mixed into tonics and tinctures peddled as cure-alls by snake oil salesmen. It was also, famously, an ingredient in Coca-Cola until 1929. This is all to say that one did not need to engage in criminal behavior in Bennett's time to become addicted to cocaine. In the 1890s, he began a routine of staying at Salt Sulphur Springs Hotel in Monroe County, West Virginia, to recuperate when his health was poor. There he relaxed, gained weight, soaked in its famous mineral waters, and engaged in creative work. He first started working on what would become his most famous novel, Master Skylark, at the resort. Although it is a known as a book for juvenile readers, it is an engaging and vivid story with a vocabulary and prose style that would challenge and entertain people of all ages. It is always sold well, and it has been passed down from one generation to the next. It remains popular today, over 120 years since it was first published. Master Skylark is the story of Nicholas Atwood, a young boy with a beautiful singing voice living in England during the time of William Shakespeare. Through misadventure, he gets caught up in a gang of traveling minstrels who exploit his talent for their show. Bennett brings the Elizabethan era to life in exacting detail made possible through meticulous research conducted over many years. The story was first anthologized in St. Nicholas Magazine from 1896 to 1897, and later printed in book form. Bennett was 32 when he finally achieved substantial success as a writer. Master Skylark would continue to provide income for him for the rest of his life, as it was reprinted, released in new editions, and translated into other languages, even Braille and Esperanto. But Bennett got more out of his stays at Salt Soulful Springs than recuperation. It was there he met his future wife, Susan Dunlap Adger Smith. When they first met, he was 29 and she was 16. Susan was on vacation at the resort with her parents and they had occasion to renew their acquaintance over the ensuing years when returning there. They stayed in touch through letters with the permission of her parents, who were counted in the upper echelons of Charleston's societal structure. Bennett made inroads with correspondence, both by courting Susan and separately by impressing her father as to his suitability as a future son-in-law. In 1898, when Bennett was recuperating from one of his many maladies, he was advised by his doctor to spend the winter somewhere warm. He chose Charleston for both its warmth and proximity to Susan. Through a series of inquiries with Susan's father, he was inv invited to stay with the Smiths until he could find a suitable room to rent in the city. He was disappointed by Charleston at first, but found that he was considered a celebrity in high demand due to Master Skylark. He was also, by association, being endorsed by one of the most prominent families in the class-conscious city. After a brief stay at the Smith family manse at 31 Ligar Street, Bennett moved to a rented room at 18 Meeting Street, the Thomas Hayward Jr. House. This is a serendipitous foreshadowing of the friendship he would have some two decades hence with Thomas Hayward's descendant, DeBose Hayward. It was in that house that Bennett worked on his next novel, Barnaby Lee, for which he would be paid a handsome sum when it was first published in serial form then released as a book in 1902. With that success, he considered himself a professional writer and ready to support a wife and family. John and Susan were married that year. After renting an apartment, they moved into their own home at 37 Ligar Street in the summer of 1903 and remained there the rest of their lives. In the years leading up to the founding of the Poetry Society, DeBose Hayward had been meeting Bennett every week at 37 Ligar for guidance and critiquing sessions. Bennett relished the role as mentor and helped Hayward bolster his prematurely curtailed formal education by nitpicking his writing and suggesting books and poems to read. Around the same time, a teacher at Porter Military Academy befriended Bennett's son, John Jack H. Bennett, a student at the school. That teacher was Hervey Allen, 
a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, whom Bennett later described as a veteran who came home from World War I, rough and raw to the soul, from the army and murder and horror sustained most courageously, hated most wholly, with great personal suffering, passionate and physical, from great wounds and visible death of many a friend. He was already a published poet by the time he moved to Charleston a year earlier. The Bennetts asked Jack to invite Alan over to dinner one night, and they were duly impressed with the man's intellect, vast knowledge of literature, and his gregarious nature. Soon Alan would be added to the Wednesday night sessions between Bennett and Hayward, and together they developed a brutal critiquing practice where they picked apart each other's work with rigor and machismo. These meetings were dubbed fanging sessions, and they often described their process with the imagery of a wolf or other vicious carnivore revealing its incisors and ripping its prey to shreds. Meanwhile, unbeknownst to Bennett's group, a poetry club of women was meeting nearby, probably under less merciless practices. They were led by Miss Laura Bragg. And I'll stop here on page 8 for today's reading.